Hello, good afternoon. Um, welcome to Protecting Our Children, What's Next for School Safety, a panel discussion by the San Antonio Report. My name is Lee Munsell, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of the San Antonio Report, and I'll be moderating this discussion today between our panelists. We invite you to share today's conversation on Facebook and help ensure this critical conversation reaches everyone in the community. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the sponsors who helped make this important discussion possible as well as free and accessible for all. A special thank you to our gold sponsor, the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Thank you also to our silver sponsors, Lakeshore Learning, Schulman Lopez Hoffer and Adelstein LLP, and the new School of Science and Technology online campus. Thank you again to our sponsors. Thank you also to each of you in the live virtual audience for joining us today. If you find value in local reporting efforts and civic engagement events like this one, we invite you to support the San Antonio Reports nonprofit newsroom by joining our membership program today. Check out the link in the chat for more information and to donate today. Now, please join me in welcoming our panelists. We will be joined today by Police Chief William McManus from the San Antonio Police Department. Thank you. Police Chief Wallace McCampbell from the Northeast Independent School District. We also have Police Chief Richard Palomo from the Southwest Independent School District joining us today, as well as Principal Shireen Dixon of San Houston High School and Superintendent Dr. Jeanette Ball from Judson Independent School District. Thank you all so much for me meeting us today and for joining in this conversation. It's an incredibly important moment um, and I appreciate each of your time today to join us. Um, obviously heading into the school year, this is a school year like no other. In the wake of the devastating shooting just down the road in Uvalde, what is the mood heading into the first day of school? Help you, how do you help kids learn math, science, reading and writing when something as essential as physical safety is so front of mind? Uh, Dr. Ball, why don't you start us off on that question? Absolutely. Um, thank you for, for having us here. And I know that this is what all our parents and, and our staff, too, are, are talking about. And this is something that um, has, has been very important to us the entire, the entire time, but specifically more important now. And uh, what we have done is spent a lot of time doing different types of training. Um, specifically, we're doing one that's called the Craze Training and all our administrators have gone through that. We're currently now this week training our staff on, on that training and doing a lot of things to be proactive. Um, the training, the making sure that the entrances for our campuses are locked and that we're monitoring the entrances that we do have by limiting the entrances that we have. We recently sent out a message to all the parents that it might be a little bit more time consuming to come into our campus, but we're gonna take extra security measures of making checking IDs and making sure that we know everybody that goes in and out of our buildings. Also things such as fencing that's going on, um, being put up, uh, a lot of more security cameras um, and, and just a heightened awareness that this is everybody's responsibility. Uh, we've also hired additional officers but this is something that's truly a teamwork. It is not just the police department, not just the campus administrators, but in order for our buildings to be safe, it's something that we're all working on. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ball. Principal Dixon, good to see you. Glad to have you today. Um, we just kicked off our panel uh, with the question uh, that I think is th the most important question heading into this school year. Obviously, security, school security, and keeping kids safe is so front of mind for parents, for students, for administrators, as well as um, the police departments um, on the various campuses. Uh, but the question also is how do you approach a school year and teaching kids the things they need to know, reading, writing, math, all the rest of it um, in this moment and against this backdrop? So Principal Dixon, did you have a, a thought on that? Yes, thank you guys for having me. Um, I'm with Dr. Ball. We ensure school safety and we also say that school safety is everyone's responsibility, right? Um, it's not just the administrators. We have the teachers focused on learning. Um, one of the things that we're doing this year is every teacher can, uh, keeps their doors locked. Every door will stay locked in a, in a school. And we, it wasn't always like that, right? Like, but now all doors are locked. Um, 
as Dr. Ball was saying, it's uh, very, you know, they have to go through to get into the building. Students, uh, the families have to just, it may take a little longer, but they do. We have a camera outside that we can see the student, the people that are coming in. They have to show ID. They go through our Raptor system. Um, we keep the doors locked. And when it's a high school, of course, we have multiple buildings, right? Like mm -hmm. students have to move. So we do have additional security. We have additional police officers on the campus. Um, and like every teacher stands by the door, we move students along um, and we make sure to wipe through the school before making sure, I mean, before moving on as administrators. Yeah. So we ensure all doors are locked. We check all doors between every class because there are so many students moving through so many um, buildings that we check all doors before resuming back to what we were going to do. Absolutely. Um, have you found that it's been doable to get everyone on campus to participate in that process to, to work together to keep the campus safe? Yes, it's doable. I think everybody understands the importance of school safety. So everybody is on board with um, the duties that they have to do before going straight into the classroom. Great. Um, Chief Colomo, I wanted to, to talk to you um, briefly. Can you tell me a little bit about what uh, security looks like on the campuses for Southwest ISD? Yes, yeah, so I often get asked that question. So we have a very robust uh, security and safety program. We have a director of safety that we work closely with. Uh, we do have that privilege of having a, a safety director. A lot of ISDs don't have that. So uh, we work really closely with him uh, and we take a, a layered approach to keeping our campuses safe. It starts with uh, the exterior, uh, with fences. That in itself is a physical barrier and also a psychological barrier. And then uh, the next tier is uh, as you enter our, our buildings, it's a single point entry where you go into a, a holding area. It's called a vestibule and you are vetted there. And once you vet, once you're vetted, you're, you are run through a, a national database to make sure that you're not on some type of sex offender database. And if you're clear, then you can proceed into the main office. Uh, we also uh, have signage throughout the district. We have a very important safety campaign called See Something, Say Something that's tied into a, an anonymous reporting app where our community stakeholders can report suspicious activity. And they do a really good job of reporting uh, suspicious activity in and around our communities. Uh, we also have done internal safety audits to check all our exterior doors and interior doors, and we're taking uh, appropriate action to address those that are malfunctioning prior to school starting. Uh, we've done numerous PSAs. So a lot of times when you talk about school safety, uh, the students are left out of the equation. So here at Southwest, this, we empower our students to take ownership of school safety. So they've done some powerful PSAs with our police department uh, in regards to our See Something, Say Something campaign. They've done a great job with that. Uh, we also address the social, emotional uh, aspects of students. We know that we're coming out of a pandemic. Uh, there's been a lot of stressors in their lives. Uh, there's a lot of uh, anxiety about coming back after your Valdi. So we wanna make sure that we have all the resources available for our students. And we have a multidisciplinary team here that I'm really proud of. It's at, it's at the district level and also at the campus level. It's called Southwest Cares. So when a kid comes to our attention that they're struggling emotionally or having some mental health issues, we immediately meet and uh, we staff that and we try to get them proper interventions to make sure they are successful. And if you would, I'd like to share a, an example of how this particular program works. Right uh, before we graduated uh, okay. back in May, we had a young man that came on our radar. Uh, San Antonio Police Department was called out to this place of employment where he was showing some uh, concerning behaviors uh, where he threatened uh, some coworkers and made some comments that really uh, alerted his uh, supervisor. So in turn, they called San Antonio Police Department, who in turn called us, and we immediately uh, Got the ball rolling. This happened on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, a lot of us were off. We were out of town. So we got together. We Zoomed. And we said, what, what is the best course of action for this young man and for this, the safety of our students? So we got the young man the help that he needed. He was uh, committed. Uh, he was ED, which means uh, he was emergency detained and taken to one of the local mental health hospitals for the help that uh, he needed. And I'm happy to report that he is doing well now. So we possibly averted a, a, 
a, a school shooting. He was homicidal and suicidal. So uh, I, I'm just really proud of the work that our team is doing. Uh, we don't work in silos. We work together. And that's the only way you're going to be able to keep kids safe is working together with all these different entities, not only in your district, but with your external partners. Another thing we do is we really renew the emphasis on school safety, keeping that a priority and holding staff accountable for those that don't embrace a, a, a culture of school safety. That 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 is starts from the top. And we, and we try to model that. Uh, also, our goal is to have every campus trained. We use what we call standard response protocol. That is a, a uniform standard to, to respond to uh, emergencies in schools. And all our administrators have been issued this, this book here. It is their Bible. It, it's very sim simple. It's uh, plain language. And this tells them how to handle an emergency at their campuses. And it's all action driven, depending on what happens at your campus, it dictates what action you're going to take. And also, we've done a lot of work with our extender partners. Uh, this summer, our officers have been really busy. We've done some work uh, with SAPD, the Bear County Sheriff's Office, and DPS. I, I believe that, that there is a real importance of doing some integrated training with these external partners because the reality is that officers on the campus are going to be the first ones going in. And, uh, and it could be an SAPD officer, a sheriff's officer, or a DPS trooper. They need to know what to do. They need to have a plan of action. And what we're trying to do is give these officers as much reps as we can to eliminate confusion because with this thing, these things happen, they're very dynamic and normally they're over in five minutes. So we want to make sure that our officers commit this to muscle memory. And I could go on, but that, that's some of the things that we're doing here at Southwest ISD. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. I did want to ask a little bit about what that um, in the event of a school shooting, what is the protocol? I wanted to bring you in, uh, Chief McManus. How long would it take SAPD to respond in the case of a shooting? And, and based on how long it would take, what is your relationship with the various school district um, police departments uh, to respond in, in a scenario like that? Yeah, I believe you're muted still, sir. There we go. There you go. It would typically depend upon how many officers were, were in the vicinity of the school, but I can pretty much predict, I would pretty much predict that uh, it, it would be uh, a, a matter of minutes before someone would arrive there uh, in response to, to a school shooting. And let me, and the, and the coordination that we have, uh, Chief Palomo was talking about, we had met shortly after the Uvalde incident uh, to talk about a coordinated response. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, we offered up uh, training. We have a, a, a nationally recognized SWAT team here that does training. Um, and we offered that up. I think uh, we offered that up not only to um, the, uh, the school chief, but to the uh, college as well, the uh, college chiefs uh, uh, around the city. And so we've offered that up to ensure a, a coordinated response. But let me, let me jump off that specific topic for a second. A lot of the, the threats that come to light here in San Antonio, we pick it up in our fusion center. And the, the, the instant that we receive any information, because we're monitoring social media, uh, we're monitoring, you know, all kinds of open source data, so, uh, data points. And as soon as we get information that a, a threat, a veiled threat or any kind of conversation surrounding uh, threats to schools happens, we are tracking that individual down and making contact with them. Uh, most of those threats turn out to be not credible. Uh, we do follow up with the individual though, who's, who's talking that uh, about those threats and take whatever steps we need to from a law enforcement perspective, whether it's to emergency detain that person or actually arrest that person. But we, we cut a lot of those, those uh, potential events off in the very beginning from the information we get at our fusion center. Got it. Um, Chief McCampbell, I wanted to uh, get you into the conversation. If you um, had a thought on how security works in terms of working with the SAPD 
um, uh, on your end? We might have a bit of a delay on that. Um, Chief McCampbell, did you want to weigh in on uh, your plan for school security this year? Okay. Sorry about the, the technical uh, technical difficulty there. Um, one of the questions I wanted to make sure that we talked about is just the scope of the, um, the issue. There are at least 15 independent school districts in Bear County, um, up to 20 if you count what students in, in districts who are from Bear County, but the districts themselves are outside the county. Um, when you add in private schools and charters, there are more than 375 students spending their days on school campuses in this county. Um, keeping our schools safe is a massive, massive task, and each of you plays a role in that process. Ultimately, whose job is it to secure our local campuses? I can jump in. Uh, I think it's all of our jobs, right? Like it's the community, it's everybody in the school, it's the students, because students know a lot, right? So students come and share. Um, as Chief McManus said, they monitor social media. Our police officers monitor social media. So it truly takes all of us to keep them safe. It's from the cameras on the doors where the student, where the parents have to wait in the vestibule so they can clear. It's from students making sure the doors close behind them or administrators or teachers pulling the doors closed or teachers keeping the door closed. It is truly all of our responsibilities to keep the students safe. Lake, like, can I weigh in on that? Yeah. yeah, so so basically what our mantra here at Southwest ISD is that school safety is a shared responsibility and and we make sure that our stakeholders understand that. And also we place a lot of focus on building a positive relationship with students. In my experience has been that if you build those positive relationships with students, uh, they're gonna they're gonna trust you and they're gonna let you know what's going on, on their campus because in the, the day they want to go home safe just like we do. But you have to build those trust. And I had an opportunity to talk to our district leadership uh, last week. And I left them with a challenge. I said, I'm not concerned about the kids that are involved in uh, sports or band. I said, I want you to really focus on those kids that are loners that nobody pays attention to. So I, I, I challenged them with getting a roster of all their students and putting A's by all the students that their staff know. I said, and then you're going you're to look at the, the, the kids that have no stars. Those are the kids that we need to focus on. And let's build a relationship with those kiddos. And very similar to what Chief Palomo um, said is we're doing something very, very similar um, and it's really working at making sure all our students are engaged. Uh, so we've been increasing the opportunities where our students can be engaged because we feel we feel the same way. Students that are engaged are going to be more successful because they have adults that they're building relationships with. So we've um, really work at making sure we have more opportunities for students to be engaged not only this past summer but throughout the school year where there is an after school program it's extracurricular curricular activity whether it's band cheer athletics rotc we've also built you know an rotc program in the middle school but what i do have to say that's very unique to san antonio and bear county is as everybody knows, there is lots of school districts within Bear County, but the partnership that we have with Region 20 and with all the surrounding agencies um, is truly extraordinary. Um, immediately, Chief McManus and many agencies came together through our Region Service Center to talk to us, lend support, make sure we all knew of all the available agencies that are out there to help, and then in turn, we're sharing that information with our parents because I think that one of the key components to this also is the mental health stability of our parents and our students. Mm -hmm. So I know that I, along with several other school districts, have the wraparound services where if parents need counseling, if the students need counseling, if they need to see a doctor, whatever it is that they need, that we're helping them find those resources because that's what we want to do is prevent anything like what happened in Uvalde ever happening to any of us. Our hearts have been broken and torn for Uvalde, but what we're taking this on is as a challenge that this will not happen at any of our 
Bear County School District and truly working as a team in that area. And Lee, one of the things I might add is that the, the and it's somewhat connected to this, although, although not directly, the San Antonio police have a program that's called Handle with Care. And if a child uh, is having issues or has witnessed some horrific uh, event that, that may tend to affect them, then we will send an email to the school and let them know that this child, we don't necessarily uh, describe exactly what the issue was, just for privacy reasons, but we will let them know that there has been an issue with this child and handle with care, just so they know if they see a change in the child's personality. Uh, uh, Chief McCampbell, I wanted to get you in, in the conversation. Could you tell us a little bit about, does this school year look different for Northeast ISD from a security standpoint? Not that it looks different. I mean, we every year, it's there's something different that we have to deal with as a school district as far as security and safety go. Um, we we're looking at everything we already have in place, and then kind of what we're doing is looking to see what we can enhance or do better um, every single day. You know, a lot of people come in uh, starting tomorrow will be our first day, so they'll come in tomorrow and they may not see some of the changes that that we made purposely but to know that we're looking at them every single day and that's number one on our priority is the safety of not only of our students, but our staff and everybody that comes and visits, visits one of our campuses. Got it. Um, a question for all of you um, is in the event of a shooting, one, one of these incidents that you'd be um, hoping it never comes to that, but in that event, what is the protocol um, maybe uh, Chief Palomo, you can start us off and then and then we'll jump around. Yeah, so the standard protocol, uh, we use a, a national standard by alert. It's stop the killing to stop the dying. And officers understand that whether you have a, a shield or not, your, your, your duty is to go in there and neutralize the threat. That is the national standard. And officers understand that. Uh, we really uh, have been uh, driving that point home. Uh, we revise our active shooter policy uh, to reflect that. So there is no question about what your job or role is. Yeah, Chief McCampbell, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. Our, our protocol is exactly the same thing. Um, you know, when you become an officer, that's one of the um, expectations of, of all of us is that whenever we encounter any type of active shooter or something, our, go, our, our role is to go in there and, and stop the killing. Um, and then, you know, if, if additional resources are needed, obviously we know the cavalry's coming, so to speak, you know, whether it's SAPD, um, Bear County or any other smaller municipality that, you know, our schools happen to fall in is, is we all have the common, common goal is, is to protect life and, and stop the killing. And then once all those resources, um, arrive, then obviously we're all going to work together to, to reach that common goal. So Chief McManus, from a dispatch call to um, your officers responding, knowing that there are already uh, school district uh, police departments engaged in whatever incident is going on, what what is the process for your officers walking into that scenario to make sure they, you know, help and, and don't harm the response? It's the same as was, as was just described. I mean, these, these, uh, these events are very fluid. They're fast moving. Uh, kind of hard to say what happens when we get there. If there's someone already there, uh, I will tell you that our SWAT team would be, uh, would be mobilized and they would head there, whether they're called or not, they would simply respond. Um, but we would work with uh, the school chiefs uh, who, or who, whoever's on the scene and whoever, uh, again, it, it's, it's very fluid. Uh, you, you know, if, if it's protracted that, you know, you would eventually wind up with a, with a shared command an incident command, um, you would, uh, I'm sorry, unified command, um, that would work together to, re to resolve the issue. But it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to really script out to say exactly how it happens, when it happens, what happens, because it's, 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 there's so many variables. Sure. Um, absolutely. What has training le looked like over the summer for each of your various departments when it comes to this sort of incident? 
Well, I'll start off. Um, we just did a refresher course in the in the active shooter uh, scenario training, um, and not not because of Uvalde, so to speak, but it's just something that we, we need to do periodically and regularly, yeah. you know, to make sure that we're always all on the same page. If there's okay. new um, lessons learned from previous sh shootings that law enforcement need may be uh, responded a little bit differently, but we're still going to be the first ones that, you know, and, and take the lead. But we just need to make sure that, um, whatever the, the national standard is as far as law enforcement response is that we're all up to date and, and that we're all on the same page because, you know, like Chief McManus and, and Chief Palomo said, you know, it's going to take all of us to, to end this situation. And I think if we all train um, the same way, whether we have a unified training or, or not, when officers from different agencies showed up and they all have the same training, they're going to know how to respond and work together to, to accomplish the goal. Okay. Uh, now, I think each of you has mentioned the importance of identifying potential mental health crises before they would happen within a student population. And that makes a ton of sense. I wanted to ask Principal Dixon, how do you approach that if you've gotten maybe a notice to handle with care a certain student or something's gone on with a student? How do you approach um, obviously stopping any sort of incident like like mass you know shooting incident from occurring but how do you also make the best possible outcome in that student's case without them feeling picked on or, or you know stereotyped or anything like that how do you um, approach this from a mental health perspective for individual students great question um, SASD spends over 20 million dollars on mental health uh, so we have additional uh, staff members on the campus. We have an instructional coach just for social emotional learning. We have counselors every day. We have a dedicated time. Our students go to hurricane time and every professional has students in front of them. So we have strong mentorships in the school. So when we get a handle with care for any student, um, we make sure to support them usually with the, the adult that they're most comfortable with. But so we go and do a touch point with them, not making them feel uncomfortable, but just saying, hey, how are you? You know, just because we really focus on building positive relationships. And as we continue and we get a handle with care with them, we handle them with care, right? So we go and we do touch points with them. As mentioned before, it's not the students that are on the football team and the basketball team that are attached, it's our other students. So we make sure to have a touch point, but it's the mentorship program that's very strong. You know, like every student has a champion on our campus. So we make sure that the champion knows that we had to handle with care. We don't get the details. It just literally says handle with care for Shereen Dixon. So we let them know that it's a handle with care. So we make sure to give them a little extra love so they know that we're here to love and support them. And if I can add very similar to what uh, Principal Dixon said, we also have teams. So we have a team at the district level that also works with the team, the crisis team at the campus level. Um, and, and it's truly a team of an administrator, a counselor, a social worker, a teacher, a central office individual that makes sure that nobody falls um, in between the cracks and that we're, we're meeting all the needs of, of the child. But what's really important, I think, to also keep in mind that it, it's been a hard time for a lot of individuals that we keep an eye on our adults also, um, because I think that that's sometimes we forget about them and we can't. Um, but in order for our adults to care for our children, we need to make sure that we're handling them with care because our adults are also going through a lot. So we have also an, um, instituted days where our adults can go and see somebody to talk to, to have the, uh, just an ear uh, for somebody, you know, for them to listen to them. Um, so making sure that we're taking care of the adults in our system in order to, to take care of the kids. And I know that many school districts are doing that, but we have um, the opportunity for our adults to receive five uh, free counseling sessions. So in case they have needs that need to be met, it's important for us to meet their needs so then they can be there for our students. And like many of the other school districts, we have hotlines 
where you can call 24 seven. If there's something that is going on, we wanna know and somebody's monitoring that so we can send out you know, our team, whether it's the weekend or the evening, we have our crisis teams that are ready to go out and listen, help our parents, because it's a, it's a tough job for our parents too, to, to know exactly what to do and how to handle all these situations. So we want to be there as a resource for our parents and help and guide them um, and make sure that we're using all the community resources that are available to us. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for mentioning, you know, the adults, the staffers on, on campus, um, teachers, ad administrators, uh, others who, um, you know, spend their time every day with students. They certainly feel this moment in education, similarly to the students where there's concerns about safety. Um, have you noticed, especially there's already a teaching shortage um, here in Texas, and uh, have you noticed a difficulty with recruitment or retention based on this moment in education and concerns for safety? Absolutely. You know, um, the, the superintendents in Bear County, we keep in close contact with each other and almost all of us, almost all of us um, are still missing staff members. Um, so this summer has been uh, quite different compared to any other summer for recruiting teachers and recruiting other positions. So we are definitely seeing the the shortage uh, of staff, uh, specifically teachers that we need. So we know that we, the teachers that we do have, we have to take care of them and give them a little extra TLC and love because they're going to be taking on a huge responsibility of as we open our doors to our students. Great. Um, can you, uh, e each of you, tell me a little bit about lockdown drills. Can one of you um, kind of walk me through what that experience is like, how often they happen? Um, what they're intending to teach students and teachers on your campuses? I could go first. Um, so we are going to be practicing our, our lockdown drills. I, I know that that's something that's important for our kids to practice, our teachers to practice. We don't want to go into a reactive and panic mode. We want this to be something that they're familiar with and they know exactly the expectations and what are the best practices to do. Um, so we are training with our staff and with our students for that, teaching them the tricks and the tools of how to stay safe um, and what to do if something like that were to, um, to occur. So that is something that we're practicing unannounced um, so we could be best prepared for those situations. Can I add to that, please? please. So here at Southwest, uh, I said we, we adopted the, the standard response protocol. We're putting all our staff to the training and we have uh, we designate a safety week in the fall where we do all our training and we come back and do the same training in the spring. So the goal of this training is to really el eliminate confusion. As I mentioned earlier, these events are very dynamic. Uh, they, they happen quick and they're usually over in five minutes. So time is of essence. So uh, we want to give our, our, our staff uh, the training and the tools to make those uh, decisions where they're under stress. And, and when you're under stress, a lot of things happen to you. So we want to make sure they, they we try to eliminate the confusion by practicing. And also we're, we're incorporating and the goal is to do this by the end of September active shooter exercises where we're actually going to simulate gunfire for our school and staff. Not, not our students, but our staff. They need to understand and, and, and really grab, uh, grab that concept. What is it to be under gunfire? What does that look like? So we're, we're, that's our goal is to get every campus uh, an active shooter exercise. Chief McCampbell, do you want to add to that? Yeah, we're we're doing the same thing here at, at Northeast. Um, we're actually, um, our superintendent created a new uh, director of safety and security that will kind of be able to go around to all of our campus um, and do periodic checks. But one of the tasks that this person will be doing is, is active shooter training. Um, and we're going to focus it more on staff uh, versus versus the students. I mean, the students, they'll get the basic, you know, protocol standard for a lockdown. But we also like, like Chief Palomo said, we also want our staff to be able to, to, to uh, manage and act during a time of crisis. And the best, the best way to help ensure that is, is by repetitive training. Because the more times they do it over and over again, the, the more likely that in case of an, uh, an active shooter event, 
they're going to just react and they're not going to have to think about it. They're going to know what to do. It's kind of like law enforcement, all the training that we do. Um, we go into a situation, we, we know how to act and we know that during the stressful event, we're going to, to hopefully act in, in, the, in the right way and do what we're supposed to do. And teachers are no different. You know, they need to be trained over and over again to get that repetitiveness and be able just to react instead of having to think about what they're going to do. Yeah. Principal Dixon, um, what is the experience of a lockdown drill for a teacher or a student? How do you do that so regularly without it affecting kind of, you know, the anxiety levels of the campus? Can you try again? Um, we have it every semester as uh, discussed, but we also do the safety audit over the summer. So we did a safety audit and all administrators had to go to a safety training as well as we have a safety committee on the campus. So one thing is our teachers returned today. So uh, I ran from training to come and get on mm -hmm. the video, but um, we do, we're doing one with the teachers only tomorrow. So we're allowing the teachers to fill it, to see what it's going to, we're literally going to just, it's in the actual training, but we're really just going to shut it down. Um, so we just want them to see how it feels. How do you lock down? What does it feel like? And I know we do it every semester, but because of what happened in Uvalde, I think that we need to experience a little more. So when we do it, our teachers are very versed in it because we've practiced, right? And when anything happened that's shocking, we want to be proactive. So we really want them because you you default to your training, right? You always default back to your training. So we ensure that we do it. The officers of SASD come over. We do it. Um, we check every door. We do the same process as, as every other school district. But uh, this year, I feel like it's going to feel a little different um, because it was so close to home. So as uh Superintendent Ball stated, you still have to, like, we have to be a little sensitive to them. So after tomorrow's training um, that we're actually doing at Sam Houston, after we do the training, we're going to sit down to say, how did it feel? Like, what was your first mm -hmm. reaction? So we're going to do a heavy reflection on it because we want them to, um, in the times that we're in, right, we want them to be comfortable so that they can share. So that's what one of our trainings will be tomorrow. Great. Right. If I could just add really quick, you know, what both uh, Principal Dixon and Chief Palomo said, the simulation of actually hearing the gunshots um, in the training make a huge difference. And um, I know that for our district, we mandated that training for all campus and district administrators during the summer. And I went through it myself and actually hearing the gun go off, it does. Um, raise your heart rate, it increases your blood flow. And so it is something that I think we need to all practice um, because in the long run, you wanna be better prepared. And that's what I think all of us want for our campuses, for our district and for our community to be better prepared. So though these trainings um, right now might be inconvenienced, it, it, you might see it as an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience for a moment, but worth a, a lifetime of, of savings um, that it could be something so beneficial. And here's a question for all of you, um, because one of the the big pieces of this is how do you communicate to the parents what's going on on campus, the importance of these trainings. I would imagine there are some parents that you know are, are a little stressed about the idea of their kids experiencing a lockdown drill in that way. And, and um, I don't know if everyone is saying that the students won't hear the gunshots or. Um, just some of you are saying the students won't hear the gunshots, but um, gosh, what a, what a difficult thing for a, a child to experience and to have to prepare for. So how do you communicate to the parents what is being done to keep their kids safe? Um, and what are you hearing from parents in this moment? I'll go. So uh, what we're hearing is that parents are concerned, they're nervous, they're anxious. So what we're doing is uh, we're going to have a series of town hall safety meetings where uh, we're gonna invite our stakeholders to come out and we're gonna go over our plan. You have to be transparent with parents. You have to let them know that you have a plan in place and, and go over that plan and then allow them an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, we, we believe that we have a solid plan and we're gonna convey that to our community and our stakeholders. And we're gonna let them know that we're gonna do everything in our power to keep their students safe. At Northeast, I know we were doing um, social media post sending out to our communities through Facebook and, and Twitter, kind of 
you know, given topics of safety, because it's, it's not just the district's responsibility or the principal or, or law enforcement, you know, safety is everybody's responsibility in, in order to do this. And I think if you just communicate with our parents and let them know that, you know, some of the stuff that uh, we're doing differently may not be, you know, visible, you know, as, as you walk in, but to know that, you know, we are looking at safety every single day and, and, and to, you know, ask questions, you know, and kind of educate them on um, kind of things to look for, to, to report, you know, the whole thing is, is, is prevention, right? And you sit there and if, if you kind of give them basic um, guidelines or kind of what you're looking for, and we use the, the Secret Service threat uh, adverted school shooting reports and kind of look that, you know, in looking back through the data through the Secret Service, they found there were certain characteristics that these individuals displayed up up into the up into the shooting or to, or to the attack plan, and it was something that you know there's no specific profile, but if we can relay that to our community, to our students, and to our staff, and kind of what to look for, you know, social media posts, um, different uh, demeanors, you know, all of a sudden the students no longer engaged, or you have that that handle with care incident you know, some type of family event or bullying or something. And, and, and to know that it's okay to report it, you know, it's not going to be used for discipline. It's not going to be used for any type of criminal offense. It's going to be something so you can get resource for the help. So hopefully that we can avert um, a potential shooting in, in the future. So I think the social media and getting out to our community and talking about that and letting them, you know, ask the questions so they can feel safe to send their kids. Great. Um, Chief McManus, I wanted to get your perspective on the question of what is the role of the state when it comes to setting policy for protecting for protecting campuses? Um, Governor Abbott has directed the TEA to create the school safety and security chief who would report directly to the state education commissioner. He's also announced 105.5 million in initiatives related to school safety and mental health with nearly half of that money going to the purchasing of body shields. Are those measures enough from the state? I believe you're muted still. Sorry. I, I missed the whole first part of what you said. It came in sure. very garbled. I couldn't understand what you're saying. Sure. Um, Governor Abbott has directed TEA to create a school safety and security chief. He also announced um, 105.5 million in initiatives related to school safety and mental health with half of that money going to the purchasing of body shields um, from the state. Are those measures enough to um, help local municipalities actually protect their campuses? You know, Lee, I, I don't know. I mean, I can't I don't, I don't want to comment on specifically what what is required in 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 the schools uh because I, i'm not there i don't know that's I, I leave that up to chief palomo and chief mccampbell to decide but i think that equipping uh police officers with the proper response tools or i and i don't even know if proper is the right word but if equipping police officers with tools that will help them in, in their response, I think is certainly money well spent. Uh, whether it be the uh, campus or the ISD police officers or municipal police officers, that money is very well spent providing us and them with uh, tools that will better protect them going in. And I wanna, I wanna go back and comment on one of the things that uh, Chief McCampbell said that, that struck a chord, you know, your training has to reach a level where you're not thinking anymore. You're simply responding. It becomes muscle memory and you don't have to take a minute to think. It's just automatically a response. So I, I like that what uh, Chief McCampbell said and I agree with him hundred percent. Yeah, Chief Paloma or Chief McCampbell, do you wanna um, tell us a little bit about the need for body shields on campus, if, if that is indeed a need and, and is that enough? I mean, is there more that the state could be doing to prepare um, local police chiefs? I don't know that every officer needs a body shield, but we do need equipment, uh, long rifles, because uh, the, the sidearms that our officers carry are, are no match for someone with a long rifle. 
So definitely uh, long rifles, uh, ballistic shields would be a, another uh, piece of equipment that officers would need. Uh, additional funding for training. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we need more training in the areas of uh, how to respond to these type of events. And we want to commit this to muscle memory. But the only way you do that is by training and training and training. That's what we're doing here at Southwest. All summer long, we've been doing that. I want to make sure that our officers eliminate any confusion on how to respond to these type of events. And the only way you do that is by training. And also, uh, mental health is a big issue. We talked about that earlier. Uh, I, I believe all ISD officers should be uh, directed to go through a, 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 a crisis intervention training for children. Uh, here at Southwest ISD, we do that. All our officers are mental health uh, certified. It helps them to identify kids that are in crisis, mental crisis. That, that training has been invaluable. I, I think that should be a uniform, a mandated course for all ISD officers. Got it. Chief McCampbell, did you have anything to add on that one? I would just like to, I mean, yes, equipment would be great. Um, and, you know, we could definitely use it. But I'm afraid if, if we say that shields are the answers, I don't want it to delay a response by our officers thinking that they have to go back and find, go get that shield wherever it may be in, in order to, to confront the, co confront the shooter. I mean, if, if the second, third, fourth officer, you know, showing up, he has access to a shield. Great. You know, but our first response is to go, we go with what we have on us, you know, just like breaching tools, be able to breach a door. We're not going to carry those around as we are patrolling the campuses, um, you know, and then have them instantly when when something happens. So I don't want to to make, you know, that false sense of security that if, if every officer had a shield, you know, they're going to go in there and do it because they're not going to carry it, carry it around with them. Um, you know, and not every school district is the same. You know, we have different ac um, access to to monies, whether it's through bond, bond taxes or, or funding or whatever. You know, so I, I think if there's kind of the. Um, you know, you said, as the state is doing enough, if I think the state would go in and set a foundation of what a safe school looks like, so all schools, regardless of their size or the funding availability is, is the same. And then if schools above that want to go out and enhance what the base is, you know, that should be each school district's own decision to make, but have the monies available for them to go out there and, and get those additional uh, safety products that may be out there that best suits their schools or their districts. And then in that way, we're all on the same playing field and still have the same access to all the funding that's going to be available or should be available for schools and safety. Okay. Um, since the shooting in Uvalde, we've heard a lot about the need to harden campuses. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit from each of you about what does that mean, um, but especially on drop-offs and pickups, which happen in areas of campus that are less locked down. Um, what advice do you have for parents, students in those kind of ports of entry moments um, to help keep the campus as safe as possible? You know, I we just got done with our leadership um, week this last couple of weeks and did a presentation uh, to all of our administrators. And one of those is, is, is a, visual awareness, be aware of your surroundings all the time, you know, and that includes everybody on the staff, you know, when you're out, you talk about, you know, at, at the beginning of the school, at the drop-off location, you know, the staff that's out there working, the officers that are out there, you know, patrolling the, the campuses, be aware of the surroundings and what's going on. And maybe you'll be able to, to see something before uh, a tragedy happens and, and it goes to the same with the parents. You know, they need to be aware when they're driving onto our campuses to drop off their kids. You know, that there's other kids out there and other people doing stuff that may not be paying attention. And I'm just looking at the overall safety part of it, not so much of a, of a school shooting or something like that. You know, because I think we all have stories that we could tell where, where there's been accidents in parking lots or in drop off areas just because people are paying attention the excitement, whether to, to go home or come to school each day, you know, these kids are going to be excited, especially the first couple of days as we get going here. 
and then that, that everybody needs to be a little bit more aware of the surroundings and be a little bit more cautious as they come onto our schools and, and pick them up after school. I think one thing that's important to mention is something as simple as patience and grace. Things are going to take a little bit longer and are going to be a little bit different, but every school district is doing this because we want to take care of our kids and our community. So it is, it's, it's going to take a little bit longer to, to get into the building, but it's because we want to double check, you know, who's coming in into our building. Drop-offs and pickups are going to take a little bit longer because we want to make sure that we're securely letting them out in, in a form that it's safe for, for our students. So I think that that's important to, to realize and that, you know, what, what we put in place is not to give anybody a hard time or to make it more difficult for anybody, but it's truly because we want to do the very best by our community. And I think that, that that's important because I know everybody's in a hurry and, and they're quick to get to work and, and everything. But believe me when I say that, I think I can speak for all our districts. We want to keep our students safe. Um, and it, we enjoy having our students in our buildings. We want them all to come back to us, but we have to do it in a manner Crap. that's meeting their needs to, to keep them safe. And that just does take a little bit of time. It does. Whether we're, we're checking IDs, um, having them exit the building a, a few at a time, whatever the case may be that we're doing things differently at every school district, but we're doing it because we want to ensure that all our stu uh, students make it home and make it to school in a safe manner. Great. Which brings me to one of the last questions I wanted to ask, which is what is the right balance between safety and student experience? For example, uh, Dr. Ball and Principal Dixon, I'd imagine you want parents and volunteers involved with class trips and assemblies, um, good turnout at football games and band concerts, all the things that make up a life of a campus. But I'd imagine that you also want to guarantee that those events, um, as well as daily classroom life, will be safe. Um, how do you secure a school without it feeling like a prison? And, and I think it's, you know, what I talked about, we're still welcoming parents to come in. We want them to, to be involved. We, we want them to be very active in their child's learning process. But it's, it's going to take us, you know, a little bit of time because we're going to do things differently. We're going to really do a thorough check in regards to IDs. We're, we're going to make sure that they only go to their child's classroom and, and those types of things and that just naturally takes a little bit longer to do then instead of just letting everybody come in and out uh, of the building you know our clear backpack for the stadium um, so i want to make sure i'm clear about that not for the schools but for our stadium where you have a huge group of individuals there we are going to make sure we adhere to those rules and there isn't going to be, well, just this time or just once let me come in with it. No, it's it's a rule that we have and everybody has to follow it and it might be inconvenient, but it's truly for their safety. Yeah, Principal Dixon, you wanna take that one? I was listening to Dr. Ball and I was like, exactly. Um, one of our words this year is grace. Um, we really need to for people to understand that we are truly doing it because we love our students and we want them to get home safe and come back to us safe, right? So we implemented the clear back, clear bags as well in the stadium, not in the school. Um, we also, anyone that wants to volunteer, of course, as with every other school district, they have to go through the background check. We really want our students to have the, the high school experience, right? Like we want them to have an amazing school year with amazing experience, but we also want them to be safe. So when we do pep rallies, um, where we used to allow parents to come to pep rallies, parents can't come to pep rallies anymore. Um, we've shifted that. We have, um, we do, of course, stay, uh, games and field trips and everything else. They are invited. We want parent involvement. Uh, one of the things we're going to do, SAISD is also doing a town hall for all parents. But then Sam Houston is going to do one so that they can hear it from me, right? Like they... I'm their principal, right? So they want to hear it from the principal. So we're going to have a parent meeting to discuss a face-to-face. -face. What are the shifts? Why are we shifting? With the ultimate goal, we lock arms for safety. 
We want to be together. We want to make sure we are safe. We're doing it because we all love your student, right? We all love our students. So we really want them to have a true understand and be transparent in our in our communication so they can understand why, so that everyone can give everyone grace. As well as, you know, sometimes they get upset because you say, wait a minute, you have to get this done or you have to get that or they don't always agree with the rules. But if we explain to them why we're doing this, right, like that's why we have to get in front of them first. And even communication with the teachers and asking them to provide grace to the teachers, because it's not just new for the students and it's not just new for us. It's actually new for the teachers. So we really want to for all of them to have grace with each other. And for all of us just to remember that we're locking arms and educating our babies as well as getting them home safe. Yeah, um, this has been a very heavy conversation and this is a very heavy responsibility. Um, the last question briefly I wanted to ask you all is how are you navigating the weight of this moment as leaders in education and how are you maintaining optimism for the school year to come? I guess for me, it's easy in the sense where um, we've already had some students on campus for um, for different activities and, and, and different events, and I get to interact with them, and that gives me the greatest joy. Um, looking at their eyes, looking at their faces, and reminding myself why I do this, which is because of them, keeps me hopeful, um, proud to do this job uh, for them. Um, so for me, it's it's those personal interactions that I get to have with students. It reminds me every day how important this job is and that I will do it to the best of my ability because I truly love our kids and we have amazing kids. And I feel blessed that the board has entrusted me to, to serve um, this community and I will do everything in my power to, to keep them safe. I'll piggyback off of that. I think there's no greater calling than to really uh, take care of the next generation. And that's not something we take lightly here at Southwest ISD. Uh, we have great support from our school board, our superintendent, Dr. Lloyd Verstuff. He understands that school safety is paramount because if kids don't feel safe, you're not going to educate. So we, we try to make sure that uh, we give kids a safe environment. And we do that by engaging all our stakeholders, uh, letting them know what our safety plans are, get them involved specifically getting our kids involved. They, they, they really have the solutions to this problem because at the end of the day, they want to go home safely, just like everybody else. So that's what we do. We, we empower our community and particularly our, our, our kiddos. And they understand that school safety is an inconvenience, but uh, th that's the new norm. And, and we have to do what we have to do to keep our kids safe. Great. Chief McCampbell, did you have anything to add to that? I was, I was just going to add, it, it's the, the, the smiles on the teachers and staff's face as these kids come back to school. You know, unfortunately, the Uvalde tragedy happened right at the end of the school year last year. So we I think we were only in school maybe two days after that event. So our kids really haven't been on campus really since since the Uvalde shooting. So I think as they come back tomorrow and I just know by going to some of the convocations that we've had over the last last couple of days and seeing all the excitement of all the teachers to have these kids come back. And I think if the kids see that, then they're going to feel safer and want to come in. And I think the parents will see that too. And I think that we'll just go right back into, you know, what we do as, as a as a school districts and, and educate our kids and make sure that they're safe every single day. Okay. Principal Dixon, we need to close this out with a final thought. Um, like everyone has said, truly uh, the position of an educator is a phenomenal one, right? Like, yes, it is heavy. It has shifted in my 24 years. It has shifted. Um, but as we lead and we love on them, that's truly why we do it. We do it because we do affect the next generation. We do it because we love them. And they're so amazing, right? Like we just want them to understand or understand how amazing they are and a part of that is addressing the mental health right because COVID has affected mental health so um what drives us or what drives me as an educator is the love and just knowing that they are like our ultimate job is to keep them safe and because i love them i, I don't even know what other position i would do right it, but to be an educator this is the best job so 
it is it is truly the smiles on the students' faces and the teachers' faces and the parents, right? It's the community as well. I don't know what else I would do. I love it here. Thank you all so much. Thank you to our panelists for participating in this conversation today on uh, what's next for school safety. It's hugely important conversation and really appreciate your time. A uh, special thank you to our gold sponsor, the Children's Hospital of San Antonio. Thank you also to our silver sponsor, Enable Scene LLP, and the New School of Science and Technology online campus. Thank you so much to our online audience for joining us today. If you find value in local reporting efforts and civic engage engagement events like this one, we invite you to support our nonprofit newsroom by joining our membership program today at the San Antonio Report. Check out the link in the chat to become a member today. Thank you.